Last week, I had the privilege of attending Quilt Canada 2022 in Vancouver, BC, hosted by the Canadian Quilters Association. I got the privilege of demoing on stage for Bernina Canada, and my presentation was bag making for quilters. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, as always happen, but that meant that I couldn't share my PowerPoint presentation with the attendees. They just got to see me do a song and dance. So in order to fix a little bit of that, I thought I would share my presentation on my Facebook page so that everybody could see the content that I was attempting to present to them. So today I'm going to go through my PowerPoint uh, presentation that was designed for Quilt Canada 2022. And before I get into that, I do just want to say thank you for, to Bernina Canada for allowing me as a Bernina ambassador to have that time on stage to present uh oh creations to the quilters at Quilt Canada. So let's head over to my PowerPoint. So I'm going to give you the full presentation from start to end, which means that if you've actually attended my presentation on the demo stage at Quilt Canada, you don't necessarily probably want to watch the whole thing, but you can speed through it and turn up the, uh, the speed on this presentation so you're not seeing all of it. So bag making for quilters is what my focus is today. And on my presentation, you are going to see these little QR codes that at any time you can take your phone and scan that QR code. And it's going to take you to my information. So how to find me and where my Facebook page is, my website, where you can get my patterns, all about me. All of those pieces are in that one QR code. Whenever you do see a QR code, you can always just use your photo app on your phone, hover it over, and it should zoom in on, on that code and say, hey, there's a link here. And when you give it permission, it will take you to that link. So my presentation today is about taking our quilting skills that we use to make our beautiful designs, such as this butterfly quilt, or even this, this heart quilt, this was from a, a book from Tula Pink or a, a pattern by Tula Pink within a book. But taking the skills that we have in, in making our, our loved quilts um, and turning them into uh, not just bags, but what other items that we get to carry. So my Keanu backpack where you actually have a laptop sleeve on the back as well as that front pocket using our masculine fabrics or fabrics designed by friends and colleagues such as these Bailey backpacks featuring Brett Lewis's fabrics from Northcott, natural born quilter, or toys for our kids. So this is a, a the Owen organizer where you can stuff it full of things and have it in the car for the kids. So it's about taking the skills we already have and leveraging them in another way to get more use out of our fabrics, to get to see our items more outside of the home. This one's the Chris satchel where I've actually coated it with Odicoat to make it more weather resistant and more durable. And the George travel bag. So this one can go on an airplane and you can take it through the airport. Have you ever sat in the airport and people watched and you see these beautiful bags going by? Those could be yours. All of those could be yours. And I'll be honest, I'm that person that's a little creepy sitting in the airport, probably on my phone taking hidden photos of bags weird that way. So to start with, I want to talk about those tools that most of us probably already have in our sewing room as quilters, such as our sewing machines. In this case, I do sew on a Bernina B570 QE. And I use that for my quilting 
as well as for my bag making, as well as for my quilt coats or my garments. This machine actually has all the features I need to work with most materials and power through most layers. From there, I am a, a quilter at heart, so I use my rotary cutter and my rotary cutting rulers for my squares and my rectangles. You'll find a number of bag makers that don't come from a quilting background have troubles cutting those squares or rectangles because they, they require paper pattern pieces to do so. They're just, the rotary cutter is not a tool in their arsenal today. So then you come up with those scissors. I'll admit my scissor cutting skills are, are probably equivalent to that of a, a kindergartner or a, a grade oneer. I, I do prefer the rotary cutter. But those scissors are not just used for cutting fabric, but also for cutting my webbing or cutting my zippers or cutting all those other components in my bag making world. Then we get into our clips. You'll notice that I am showing clips here instead of pins. And that's because in the bag making world and in the quilting world, we will use clips more frequently Whereas in the quilting world, you might focus more on using pins to pin your fabrics together. Here, the, the clips we'll use on binding on our quilts, hold those, those layers together, and it's no different for bag making. We want to use them to hold all those layers together. Irons, I, I can address this in two ways. We have our, our standard iron, our big iron that we use to press our seams. But then personally, I love to use a mini iron, not just for travel or right by my sewing machine when I'm quilting, but also whenever I'm bag making, that little iron will fit its way right inside my bags for the final pressing and for snugging that lining right into place. And of course, color theory. Color theory comes into every single thing that we make. Now, whether that's that's a monochrome project where you're doing black and white, or perhaps your, your color matching, or you're trying to get complementary colors. Color theory comes into play so heavily in everything we're playing with. So I will personally, whenever possible, take my picture of a quilt or my picture of a bag and use my pencil crayons to color in some of the core color functions in that, that design. So it's not about getting the print in there from my fabric, but it's about finding the main colors in that print and putting it in there. So there's a number of different tools. And of course, these are not all of them by any means possible. But there's a number of different tools that we'll use in quilt making that are easily translated over into our bag making. Another really good one would be um, your clapper for pressing. Being able to put that clapper down on hot seams after you've pressed it to help flatten them. Or I love to use uh, my starch sprays such as uh, Best Press, which means that my fabric will get a little bit of sizing and stiffen up a bit so that my seams aren't shifting on me as I do things. So there's even more things that cross right over between quilting and bag making. But let's take a look at some of those uncommon tools that we actually use in bag making. So some of those items that you might find around the house or you might not think are tools for sewing, but they are. Let's start with that mallet. My, my mallet is one of my favorite tools. That mallet is a tandy leather mallet. It's, it's not metal. It's also not a rubber mallet, but it is a hard plastic. And that tool is actually used for, and dare I say it, pressing seams, or in my case, smashing seams. So when it comes to heavy seams on bags, every so often it just looks a little too thick. And I really don't think my presser foot is going to fit over top of that. So I'll give it a whack with the mallet. And that helps flatten that seam and allow my presser foot to easily go over top of it. 
I'll even admit I've used this mallet in my quilting when I've got a ton of points coming together in one spot. I'll give it a whack with a mallet. It just makes a world of difference. The unusual item here is duct tape. I use duct tape on the back of my hardware. So it's on the wrong side of the fabric. When you install your hardware, you typically have screws or prongs or something that stick through the fabric so that you can fold those prongs over, put a washer on the back, whatever it may be on the back of it. When I put those prongs through the fabric and through the washer and fold them over, if you feel that metal, it's actually quite rough. I always recommend putting a piece of interfacing or in my case, a piece of duct tape over top of those prongs so that they're not rubbing against any other fabrics in your creation. Last thing you want is it to rub through that fabric and cause a hole. So duct tape. In my sewing room, I actually have a number of different duct tapes that are printed. So there's some bags that have rubber duckies in them, um, some that have rainbows in them. This comes from having a stepdaughter that loved arts and crafts. And so there was a phase we went through of duct tape projects. A tiny screwdriver. In this case, what I'm showing here is actually a battery operated screwdriver. I did find this on Amazon, nothing fancy there. That yellow button goes forwards and backwards so I can screw my screws in and unscrew them. But the key here, is you need something that has a tiny, tiny head on it because those screws that we work with when we're installing our twist locks or our screw in grommets are really quite small. So it's important you have a tiny, tiny head on that screwdriver. I also like using this battery operated screwdriver only because when I start screwing that screw into place, I don't want to strip the threads on it. So by using this, it doesn't have a lot of torque on it. So it, it's not going to push really hard on the screw and cause it to strip. It's actually going to slow down as it gets tighter and tighter. And once it stops, I know that I've got one more half twist on this to make it quite snug. So I do like this little battery operated guy just to help guide me in how tight that screw should be. These, um, I know I get asked this quite a bit, is what these are. These are hole punches in shapes. And when we look at these, we have a sharp edge on one side, and then we have a dull edge on the other. And these shapes will emulate some of our common cutting shapes that we use for hardware. So when we go to put a twist block into our bag, we want to cut out that oval of the twist block as well as the holes for the screws. Nothing's worse than taking your teeny tiny pair of scissors and trying to cut through the fabric, the interfacing, the foam stabilizer, maybe a little bit of Decoville, who knows how many layers you have in there, and do it evenly and not feel like you just massacred your entire project. So I use these punches where I'll lay it in the place that I need the hole, and then I'll use that mallet, give it a good solid couple of wax and cut right through. You definitely want to make sure you have a piece of wood underneath it and that you're on a stable surface, such as a cement floor or, or something like that. The wood beneath it, will allow the cutting edge to cut into that instead of cutting a hole through your cutting mat. And the stable surface allows it to actually cut through. If you're on a surface like a table that might have some bounce to it, you will find it very, very difficult to get those to cut through your materials. Then I have E6000 glue. This is the glue that I use for adhering metal to fabric. In this case, what I'm talking about is when I install that twist lock or those grommets, I'll put a tiny bit of this glue in there to ensure that the metal adheres to the fabric really, really well. E6000 is good for wood, 
uh, metal, fabric, many, many different surfaces. It's also found um, at your, some quilt shops, some, some quilt shops. It's found at our craft stores and it's found at places like Walmart or Amazon, any of those kind of places. It's actually a very common glue. And as much as it, it claims to have an industrial strength adhesive, it rubs right off your fingers when it's dry. So it's not going to glue your fingers like some crazy glues will. So E6000 is the glue that I like to use for metal to fabric adhesion. A rivet press. This is a hand press. This is the one from Tandy Leather that I personally do use. However, this is something I eventually graduated to. I didn't start with a rivet press. I started with a simple hand tool where it is a metal post with a curve on one end and an anvil with a, a curve on the top and using my mallet. That is how for three to four years I actually installed my rivets. Eventually, I did move up to a rivet press, but even to this day, I find value in using my hand setting tools. If my rivets are too far into a bag, you'll see that the throat on my rivet press is not very big. So it's sometimes easier to use um, just that hand setting tool. But the rivet press can be used for punching holes with a, a hole punch die for setting rivets, again, with a rivet setting die, um, for pressing pieces of metal together for your press-in grommets, again, with the proper die, or for setting eyelets, or grommets, any of these things. You do have to purchase the dies separately, and they can be quite expensive. So this is why it's kind of a graduated tool. Scotch Guard. In this case, I am showing Scotch Guard. This is not the only brand out there. This is not the only product out there. But when you finish a bag, we know how filthy our cottons can get. So I like giving it a spray of a fabric protector of some type. I mentioned a bag in my photos there that actually had OD coat on it. That's another form of fabric protection. That is another way to protect your fabric is using a paint on coater like Odie coat. It's just a little more thick than a Scotch Guard spray. Scotch Guard is something that we're, we're generally all familiar with, and you can spray it on your fabric when your product is made, wipe it off the hardware and the vinyl, and now you've got that, that layer of protection on it. Another option would be a never wet product. It's called Never Wet. And there are a few different versions of that brand out there as well. Never Wet offers a waterproofing or water resistance to your products. It does have a smell to it initially. So it takes a couple of days for the smell to dissipate. But similar to Scotch Guard, you spray it on your product, your bag, your purse, your wallet and it provides a water resistance to that, that creation. Um, another one that you might find handy would be a silicone spray. And I don't mean the WD-40. I do mean a silicone spray that you'd get from an outdoor um, activities store, a camping gear store that you would use to spray on your tent to help waterproof it. All of these are options as they treat your fabric to help it be more water resistant and stain resistant. Of course, each of them are different chemical compounds. If you do have somebody you're making a bag for who's sensitive to chemicals, do not spray it. Give them the option, make sure they know that there, there are options out there. And my books that I actually rely on on the Go Bags is a book by Lindsay Connor and Janelle McKay of Emmeline Bags. On the Go Bags is a book that came out 
quite some time ago and has been in the market for a long time and it has some amazing patterns in it. There's 15 different purses, totes, organizers. Check with your quilt store to see if they can bring it in for you because it's, it's really a little piece of gold there. As well as the complete bag making masterclass. This is a book by Samantha Hussey of Sewing Patterns by Mrs. H. And it has a whole bunch of different techniques in it that you can mix and match into the bag patterns you already have, or you can follow her patterns in that book with full pattern pieces to make your own bags. I actually was uh, privileged enough to test some of the patterns in the bag making masterclass book, as well as uh, assist with some editing in it. So it's got a special place in my heart. And Sewing Patterns by Mrs. H is a UK based designer that I've been testing for quite some time. On the Go Bags, uh, partially written by Janelle McKay, is of course from Emmeline Bags which is my go-to for my hardware and my supplies. Out of Alberta, she pretty much is your one-stop shop for your products. And you'll find that a lot of our quilt shops actually carry her hardware or their hardware in their shop. So these are some of those uncommon tools, some of which I actually originally found in my, my garage. And there's some others that you might find in your garage as well, such as I have a little butane torch that I use for melting my zipper ends or melting my webbing ends when I'm doing strapping for handles. Um, originally, I had a screwdriver from the garage. My screwdriver in the house didn't have a small enough head on it, so had to come up with something else there. Um, so there's a lot of things that you might find around your home that will help you with your bag making. You never know. Once you've got the tools down, there's transferable skills that you have in your quilting arsenal that you can use in your bag making. Of course, there's cutting. Again, I, I'm not very good at the scissor cutting thing, but I don't recommend using your fabric cutters or fabric scissors on your hair. And that leads me to that rotary cutting. If you know how to cut straight lines with your rotary cutter, or you have a good cutter and ruler and mat, you know you're on the right path. Your sewing machine, you already know your sewing machine. The big difference in what you need for bag making in relation to your sewing machine is a different seam allowance. There are some patterns that use your standard quarter inch quilting seam allowance, but there are others such as most of my patterns that use a 3 8 seam allowance, or yet others such as swoon patterns that use a half inch seam allowance. So always, always read your pattern before you get going and check out what that standard seam allowance is in that pattern. But your machine will have guides on the presser or on the plate. Or you can always add some painter's tape to provide you with that guide. Keeping in mind, if you do decide to move your needle at all, you want to shift that guide. So I typically will shift my needle knowing exactly how far it is from the edge of the presser foot. And I'll use the edge of the presser foot as my guide. But there's options there. I will sometimes, when I'm not quite sure what my seam allowance is between my needle and whatever guide I have on my machine, I'll slap a ruler down and take a look and I'll actually measure to find a landmark on my machine that I can use for my seam allowance. How about some of those other techniques we use, such as reverse applique? or applique on our quilts. Here, I've got the step-by-step -step showing how I've taken a piece of leather, or you can do this with cork, which is the black. I've cut out pieces inside it so that I can lay some K-facet fabric in behind to get those pops of colors showing through it. I also put this on a piece of foam so that it would be puffy and pop up a little bit, and give it 3D effect. 
I then cut the foam around my, my line of stitching there around the outside and trimmed my fabric back. Used a little bit of glue, such as a glue stick, um, or you could use some double sided tape to glue down those edges. And you can see how that foam is giving that 3D effect. And finally, I applicate it onto the body of my mini Billy back or mini Bailey backpack. So here I've combined a little reverse applique with some applique to create the front of this bag. Now, yes, that is a leather bag, but you can do this on your fabrics. You could do turned edge applique, or you could consider doing embroidery, a whole different process altogether. Here, I've actually embroidered on a faux leather. This is the Mora faux leather from Emmeline Bags. So don't hesitate to use the techniques you're currently using on your bags to help showcase either a skill, a piece of knowledge, or just a really cool fabric or design. You can do any of those things. Even some fabric weaving or specific fabric piecing that, that you really want to showcase can be on, on a bag. Here I'm showing a few of my patterns that I do have for sale on my website. Each of these can showcase a different one of your skills or leverage a different one of your skills, such as in the bottom row, the mini Billy backpack does use binding to finish it on the interior. As a quilter with the quilting skills already, you may find that you're more comfortable binding a bag for your first time because it's something you're you're already doing regularly. The Bailey backpack comes with two different sizes, but it also comes with that plain front panel, a hidden zipper panel on the front, or a pop-up pocket on the front. So it's great to, to learn to make the bag in a beginner level with just that plain front, step it up by changing up your front pocket, and then add to your skills with that pop-out pocket. Or the Buddy ID pouch is a really great starter project for somebody dabbling with uh, the idea of bag making because it does use quarter inch seam allowances. And it's introducing you to clear vinyl, zipper, um, and turning a bag through a turning gap in your pocket. So each of the patterns that I offer on my website, they are available in PDF download format. So you can purchase it and download it to your computer right away. But they also offer different skills in each one. Now, not only do I offer the patterns on my website, but I also offer group presentations, whether you're a quilt guild or a group of individuals that want to talk about bag making. I do offer different presentations tailored to the group that I'm speaking to such as my journey of going from quilter to bag maker. Um, I've also done talks about resourcing or materials and, and what you need in your sewing room to make bags and, and take a little mystery out of the zippers and the hardware and the interfacing. I also offer different size classes for bag making. So one day classes, two day classes, We've even hosted three-day retreats with Purple Cats Quilting where we made the Keanu backpack um, at, over the course of a weekend. And, and I will admit there are some bags that do need those three days because there's a lot of technique in there, a lot of structure, a lot of pockets, a lot of things to go through. There's also the Great Alberta Bagineer Getaway that I've hosted um, with um, Emmeline Bags and MM Cork Supply. We are looking at doing this as an annual event. It fills up really, really quick. So you definitely want to be on my newsletter to, to get to hear about these in the spring. We're contemplating doing two per year, seeing what the options are, but we're definitely doing this annually. And it's a, a retreat hosted in Calgary currently where we just get like-minded bag makers together to sew. There's no skill level required. And truthfully, I'm not even worried about you making a bag at the getaway, but come hang out with bag makers, 
share your tips, share your tricks, share your techniques, share your passion for what you're making. And then each of those patterns, well, not all of them, but most of the patterns you saw on the previous slide, I do offer as paper patterns for quilt shops to sell. So if you want your local quilt shop or you are a quilt shop that wants to carry my paper patterns, just reach out to me and we can make that a, a happening thing. From there, I do have one other activity that I, I participate within and that is the Bake of the Month Club. It's an international club that happens twice a year, spring and fall, and it's hosted by um, sewing patterns by Mrs. H. And it's three different bag pattern designers that come together to release three unique patterns that have never been seen and are surprises. So in the first month, one of the designers releases a surprise pattern that is a beginner level. The second month, a different designer will release a second pattern that's more of an intermediate level building on the skills that you learned in the first one. And the third month is more of an advanced design, allowing you to, again, build on those skills and try more things, and it's a third designer. It's a really amazing club to help build your skills, allow you a community on Facebook to safely ask the questions and engage with the pattern designer as well as you make it. And from there, here's where you can find me. As a Bernina ambassador, um, you will find me on Facebook, sewing on my Bernina machine, as well as on Instagram. You'll also find me at www.uocreations.com, and that's U-H-O-H creations.com. And I do have a Facebook group called Sewing Patterns by uh -Oh Creations, where you can engage with other individuals that have made my patterns or my testers, see some other bags that people have made and be a part of my community. So that is the presentation that I was supposed to be doing at the Quilt Canada demo stage last week. Unfortunately, technical difficulties, couldn't share all those slides. And of course, you know, you, you've got to see the puppy and the quilt, the most important part of the slides. But now that I've been able to share this, I'm, it's going up on my Facebook page where you'll be able to find it. And this is going to live forever on the internet now, which is almost better. You will probably find me hanging out online. Follow me at uocreations.com. Be sure to f sign up for my newsletter. You do get a free pattern that way. It's the Owen Organizer. And check out my, my stuff. You never know what you want to make next. I'll see you later online.